So in this lecture on wellness, we're going to pick up where we left off. Um, and so we had talked about health and wellness and the difference and what wellness was and, and how some things that are affecting your wellness. And so now we're just talking about some of the behaviors of wellness, um, things that people think about when they think about wellness, some of the things we'll look at here. Um, it could be activity. Activity is a behavior of wellness, is something that could improve or even make our wellness worse. We also have diet, uh, body weight, uh, stress, uh, tobacco use and alcohol use, disease and injury um, through sexual activity or other things. And so what you're seeing here is um, when it comes to wellness, we, we have to find the behaviors that affect our wellness that we can talk about and kind of kind of work on because um, I can't... Um, I can't uh, tell you just to become more emotionally well. Well, what does that mean? Well, maybe through activity and diet, we can we can help you to think about things or, or see things differently or stress maybe even deal with those things differently uh, and, and improve that. And so that is uh, one one kind of area um, that we want to, to look at is all those behaviors. And so there are lots of things that you can probably think about. So, so now where we're, we're, we're going to take this, we've got the behaviors of wellness, and we'll talk more about these this, the rest of this semester, really all of these behaviors that affect our wellness. Is, as college students, what are some of the biggest things that affect your wellness? And so I put this list together. I was a college student, but, but it's probably some of the things in a, that, that still affect your wellness the most. So uh, things from stress. A lot of college students uh, stress and talk about stress a lot, and so we'll talk about, well, how do we deal with those? But um, realizing that is a big issue. Um, anxiety also, anxiety um, that goes along with college and, and all the things that, that happen in life because you, a lot of college students are dealing with life uh, on their own for the first time or in at least a different way, uh, and that can be there. Uh, sleep affects college students' uh, wellness a lot. Uh, some of you get way too much. Most of you don't get enough, uh, and this affects your wellness. Uh, cold, so so not the temperature, but like colds. Literally the colds you get, those days you, you wake up and you just don't feel good. You can function, you go to class, you go to work, but you don't want to be there. You don't remember what was said. Uh, your work is not the best. Those days affect your wellness just as much as anything else. As even having the flu and being in bed, sometimes that affects our wellness worse than those days of, of just having a cold where we don't feel good. Uh, depression. Depression is high in college students. We see it more and more. Um, screen time is huge. You may, you may say, well, what is screen time? Well, screen time is... Um, typically it was defined as kind of like in front of a TV screen, um, but screens are everywhere now. So kind of technology uses from TV to projector to, um, computer and phone, uh, you guys get a lot of screen time. Um, how much screen time is enough? Well, that's a great debate. Um, how much screen time you should you get? Who knows? Uh, but some of you get 24 seven of screen time because you're always on some kind of device doing something and watching TV at night and all of these things. Um, this course, you're going to get screen time. Your lectures are um, online. Your book is online. And your assignments are online. So you're building up screen time all the time. But what we want to try to do is minimize that. Try to lower the amount of screen time we get. So taking times away from that. Because typically when we're in front of a screen, we're not being active. We're not making the best wellness decisions. So we know the higher your screen time is, uh, typically your wellness will suffer. You could see it improve without that. Diet is something else that affects college students and their wellness. Um, Typically, college students don't make the best decisions. Uh, it has to do with several things. Some of you do really good. Most most do not. Um, and that's because um, do you know what the best food is um, as a college student? Like the very best food. Uh, and you're, you're thinking to yourself and you're like, well, there's no way that the, the very best food um, as a college student is the same for everyone. It is. It is the exact same. Every student will agree to this. So you might be thinking like, Pizza, not a bad answer. Maybe ramen, uh, that's, a, that's a good answer too, but, but not the best student. The best food, the best food as a college student is free food. It's free food. That's what is your driving factor is most college students is the cost. And so if there's free food, you're all in. It doesn't matter what it is. It's the best food ever if it's free. You can buy the best steak in the world, but if you get that steak for free, it's 10 times better, and especially as a college student. Free food's the best food, and typically if it's that's what's the most concerning is the cost, and especially if it's free, it's not going to be the healthiest. It's not going to be the best thing for us. We're not going to make the best decisions. Um, exercise affects our college students. Um, typically, we see one of two things happening. For most college students, we see them get less and less physical activity the more and more they go through college because they have 
more and more things on their plate, such as jobs or more schoolwork or trying to get that career and internships. Some people do exercise more, and it can be an issue, but typically we see college students exercising out a lot, or most of them don't exercise uh, much at all. Um, drugs and alcohol affect college students. Uh, many people try uh, a lot of drugs for the first time and start abusing drugs for uh, the first time when they enter college. Alcohol is a big issue as well uh, in that same scenario. Um, and then sex also plays a role in your wellness. Um, uh, from STDs and pregnancies to being more uh, sexually adventurous uh, and try, or just, just doing more sexual activity, uh, these can affect your wellness and typically in a negative way uh, when we look at that because the proper uh, safety precautions aren't taken can definitely have an effect on your, your wellness. And so we have those particular things. And so when it comes to it, um, we're hoping that this course, throughout throughout this course, now that you have an idea of, of wellness and, and what we're looking at, uh, that at some point you you may see a behavior that you want to change. At some point through the semester, maybe you're like, ah, you know what, I need to change that. Or maybe it's not even during this course, but maybe it's a couple years from now. You're like, you know what, I need to do better in that. I need to do better in that area. And so we want to teach you, well, how do you change your behavior? How do you actually go about it? Because there is a right way and a wrong way. If you've ever tried to change anything in your life, you know that it's not easy, um, that it's difficult, and especially if you're not if you're not doing it in a way that sets you up for success, it's it's all it's nearly impossible. And so, when it comes to changing your behavior, the very first thing you have to do before you change your behavior is know what you're currently doing, know your current health habits. So, if you want to change your diet, what are you currently eating? If you um, if you want to increase the amount of exercise, well, how much exercise are you currently getting? Maybe you are getting enough, and maybe there's something else that we that, that's causing um, what you're. Or there's another thing that you need to do to achieve what you want to. Um, after you you know what you're currently doing, well, then you need to choose a, a target behavior, because when you're when you're looking at your health habits, you may quickly most of us quickly realize that there are several things that we need to work on to improve our wellness, but we don't want to change those things all at one time. We want to change one behavior at a time and get used to that because that's going to make us more likely to be successful. Um, if you change multiple things at one time, more than likely, within a couple months, you're not going to be sticking with any of those changes and you're right back to where you started. So we'd rather change one uh, permanently than change a couple for a short time. You then need to learn about it. You need to learn what it what it takes to, to change that behavior. You need to learn what does that target behavior look like. So diet is an easy example. Well, if you want to change your diet, what does eating... Uh, better look like? What should I be eating? Uh, and this course could be helpful for that. Um, and then always make sure you're willing to find help. Some things you might want or need. Uh, some people, some expert or someone who's done it before to help you out, um, which is very common in people who are trying to quit the use of alcohol or tobacco or drugs. They find someone who's done it before, someone they can always look up to um, and follow through that process uh, and can give them guidance. And so that's kind of the start of a behavior change. And so we want to talk a little bit about it more and the fact that with a behavior change, one of the things that, that's going to define your likelihood or, or is, is going to be a big help or a big hindrance in the likelihood of you changing your behavior is what we call motivation. So um, what's driving you to make this, this behavior change uh, or what's driving you to do this? And so there's lots of things that can help build our motivations, lots of things that help drive us to to be more motivated, to, to drive us to change this behavior. And there are some things that can uh, take that motivation away from us. For some people, they can build motivation through a pro-con list. So putting down a list of what are the pros for changing this behavior and what are the cons for changing this behavior. Um, some people those work great on, some people they don't. Um, realize just because the pro list has way more things on it doesn't mean that it's going to build motivation. It's the value you put in those things. So if um, you want to change your diet, I could list a thousand different reasons why you should eat. I should eat healthier. Okay, that's personal. Like why I should eat healthier. But in the con list is typically eating healthier is a little bit more expensive. And to me personally, it doesn't taste quite as good. And if I put all my value on the price and the taste, well, it's unlikely that a pro con list is going to help build any motivation. It's just going to decrease it. And so we have that. We also have self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is um, how much control you feel you have of changing a behavior. So how much control you feel you have of it. So do you feel like you have the control of a particular behavior? So um, an example of this is if you look at a smoker, somebody who's been smoking for a long time, if you talk to them and you ask them, do you feel like you can control whether you smoke or not? 
most of them are going to say, I don't feel like I have control over whether I smoke. I feel like I have to have it in order to be able to function normally and to, and, and to, to just do my everyday activity. I feel like I have to have it. I feel like I don't have control. Well, that, that self-efficacy is, is very um, telling in the fact that if they don't feel like they have control over it, they're probably not going to be successful at changing that behavior. It's hard. Um, if they feel like they have control, they're much more likely to do that. And very related to self-efficacy is something we call locus of control. So what or who actually has control over this behavior? So in a smoker, the person who has control over whether they smoke or not is that person themselves. The, per the smoker themselves has control over whether they smoke or not. However, if they don't feel like they have control, they're not likely to actually change that behavior. When a smoker feels like they have control over that behavior and because they actually have the control of smoking, they are likely to succeed. We can also have the reverse as true um, with eating. Some of you may live with your parents or may live with someone who, who does a lot of the cooking or buying of the groceries. Well, if someone else is buying the food in the, in the house that you eat at, you may not actually have control over it. But if you feel like you have control over what you eat, you'll make better decisions and still be able to be successful in your behavior change. So self-efficacy and locus of control are related. The best spot you can be in is to feel like you have control and to actually have control over behavior. The worst spot to be in is where you don't have control over that behavior and you don't feel like you have control will lead to not so much success. Other ways we can build motivation is through visualization or self-talk. So it's talking yourself up and building yourself up into saying you can do something. Uh, and visualization is visualizing yourself being successful at something, but not just the, the end goal of I visualize myself uh, being a better eater, but the whole process of, of making um, a salad and from start to scratch, buying the ingredients and, and making that salad and mixing it together and eating that salad and, and feeling better after eating it. That's visualization, and it can build motivation um, really well. It can help in behavior changes. And athletes do visualization all the time. Every professional athlete, before they start in a competition, is usually sitting there picturing themselves step by step being successful at achieving their goal. In our case, it's behavior change. For them, it may be a certain competition, winning a game or a match. Having role models can build uh, motivation because you see someone being successful at it, and if they can do it, so can you. Um, but when it comes to motivation, um, one of the things that can, can drag us down and, and be in the way is um, a barrier. And a barrier, when you think about it, is something that gets in your way, gets in your way from moving forward. And in a behavior change, it's something that keeps you from being successful at your behavior change, keeps you from moving forward. And you've got to identify barriers and then figure out a way that you're going to deal with them. So a barrier um, for me, so exercise for me. I know a barrier for exercise for me is literally the time of day. If the clock strikes noon, if the clock strikes noon and I have not exercised, I will not exercise for the day for whatever reason. I feel like when it hits when it hits 12.01, um, if someone would say, hey, you want to go exercise? I'm like, eh, no, I don't. Day shot. Even though I might not have anything else to do the rest of the day, if it strikes noon and I haven't worked out for the day, I will not. I just It's a barrier for me. So I've got to make sure I exercise out, exercise in the morning. Um, it could be an example with diet, maybe, or even drug use is, is, is part of this. Maybe a barrier is the people you hang out with. I've got a group of friends. When I hang out with them, I make terrible eating choices just because it, of who it is. Like we, we get together and we make terrible eating choices. Um, but I've got another group of friends that when I go out with them or when I hang out with them, for some reason I make better choices when it comes to my eating. And so they're, 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 I have to identify that barrier, and for a lot of people, it happens to be the people you surround yourself with or the day uh, that you're doing it or the activity or, or, or whatever. And so it's really important for uh, our motivation to look at and identify what those barriers are. And so with that, we will um, we'll kind of stop here, and we'll pick up the rest of our wellness chapter in uh, the next lecture.